exist for the world. It does so not in virtue of any dignity, authority or power imminent to its creaturely nature as one people among others, but in virtue of the plenary power which is which it's invested and which is thus proper to it and in with its foundation as this people. End of quote, bar, page 501. Second, secondly, a further problem I have with this view is that it does obliterate any it does obliterate any distinction between the temporal and eternal quote uh, Bonhoeffer it may be difficult to break the spell of this thinking in terms of two spheres but it is nevertheless quite certain that it is profound contradiction to the thought of the Bible or the thought of the Reformation and consequently it aims wide off reality there are two realities but only one reality that is the reality of God which has become manifest in Christ in the reality of the world. Sharing Christ, we stand once in the reality of God and the world. End of quote. The problem with this view and Bonhoeffer's statement is the reality is stated to be the absolute, which is the infinite, i.e. Uh, creation. If this is the case, it would be foolish to talk in terms of any antithesis language. Good and bad, heaven and hell, make no sense with Bonhoeffer's idea. If God and creation are but one reality, then it will affect the doctrine of evil. Man being creation, God being creation, then God will either be stated as having moral imperfection, or imperfection will be seen as an illusion. This view causes more problems than it solves. It's a bit convoluted and complicated there. Um, but I think... Um, Niebuhr's a liberal and I, I don't agree with the, the way he interpreted um, uh, uh, what's his name um, Augustine I think basically yeah. what I'm trying to say is um, what am I trying to say uh, <laughs> I think it's like so, uh, Morris is like a socialist mm. um, and basically he's, he's saying unless we uh, the, the only hope for society is basically that individuals realize that the salvation is in community and that's what he's saying Morris um, so and I, I don't even though I've said you can use counseling I don't particularly agree with that so anyhow it's a bit convoluted there Mark but have you got any thoughts mate it's a bit it's a bit um, it's a bit deep I was just thinking about sure so Christ the transformer of culture is he saying that's the correct vision then is that what his conclusion is no he was just he's just giving like five or six models but he is a like neo-orthodox kind of liberal kind of guy so he's he's he misunderstands some of the people that he's talking about like like Augustine but I think in this one he's he's saying uh, I just he's saying that cult, I think he's saying that um, that human I think this position is saying that human beings are corrupt but they're not that bad they can be redeemed I think he's saying that and I think he's saying it's done socially so you so the counseling the whole point of counseling the whole point of Morris for this view is that uh, the the way to bring healing to 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 people to culture <clears throat> is to bring them together socially this is how you transform culture and, and Christianity can help with that. Yeah. Kind of, kind of like basically, it's kind of like counselling where people counsel and get people to realise their inner goodness. I think that's what it's saying. You get people in together as a community, and you get them to realise their inner goodness. That's what he's saying. Yeah. Is your is your about a Christian community then, or is your about just any community? I think yeah, I think he's hinting at Christian community, um, Niebuhr, and then uh, Maurice Roberts was definitely 
thinking that way. I think Morris Roberts was influenced by socialism. But thinking, yeah. thinking, but using Christian language, using his socialism, but taking Christian language, putting them together. So when when socialists would talk about getting people together and and giving them rights and stuff like that, Morris would talk about uh, Christ's kingdom and we've got to be together in Christ's kingdom. So, yeah. Uh, For me, I think I think these like theological reflections are helpful in that they, they make you think, but at the same time, I think they're a bit wishy-washy because they because um, I think f from my perspective, I mean, there are evangelicals. There, are, there are, like when we were at seminary. Um, I thought, I don't know what you thought, but I thought most of the people there thought about when they go into ministry, it was about transforming culture. Yeah. It was not about getting people saved and born again. That's my thought. And yeah. if you remember yeah. if you remember Chris Culp, the lecturer. Oh yeah. <laughs> When he used to go on, you know, his whole agenda was to get people into the social gospel, wasn't it? Is that what his agenda was? I don't know. Was it, Jay? <laughs> yeah, that was his agenda. Oh, like... the, yeah, that was his agenda. Like, when you looked at the way he set out the lectures and what he was trying to do. Yeah, I, you must be, be clever picking that up, Jay. I was just lost over there. <laughs> <laughs> you used to always say he used to put, like, rip the pills in them, didn't you? And they'd be like, there's an agenda in every one, wasn't there? Yeah, well, with Chris <laughs> Paul, if you remember, he's, he he um, he did, um, oh, what's that, uh, what's that European evangelical group called? Like, major European evangelical group. What do you the know? John Stott was involved in it years ago. Oh, right. Um... I can't remember, Jay. There was a big, I can't remember, uh, it'll come to me, but there was a big, in the 50s, there was, it, with Billy Graham, there was the emphasis on preaching the gospel, yeah? Oh, yeah. But in the 60s, in the Anglican Church, uh, and other churches, there was a big debate about, we've got we to gotta do social work, we've got to get the church to be socially engaged. Well, that's what it's turned into, Jay, now, to be honest. Yeah. The only because you like social workers, brother. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and so like it, there was a big document written uh, in Europe amongst European evangelicals, and Chris Corp's whole course was built round that, trying to get you thinking about uh, the gospel and culture and uh, social action and stuff like that. And so basically, he was he, he was. He was trying to encourage people to realise that the church had to to go out and do more creative ministries of of social transformation, uh, yeah. and, and you know, and that it was just as important as proclamation. But really, deep down, what what he he wanted was social transformation rather than gospel preaching. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I'll, I'll just read the last bit and then we can just talk about that because that, that's I've got one or two things that are really important to say on that and I'll just read the last bit it's just conclusion I've defined Christ as an objective person who claimed to be the son of God I've taken general definition of culture by Niebuhr as the that artificial secondary environment and I've mixed this definition with Van Hoover's he saw culture as a process of myth-making. I then looked at Christ against culture, and I showed how its main loyalty was to Christ, how it has a low view of temporal as seen in 1 John 2.17. Here I looked at Tertullian and Tolstoy and pointed out how these people, though they reject culture, could not ignore it. Next I looked at Christ of culture view. I showed how this view has positive outlook to both. I noted that this view often saw Christ as the pinnacle of human achievement and I did not like this ethic. 
Uh, I also pointed out that this view tries to harmonize present knowledge with Christianity and can be too confident of human autonomy. Next, I looked at Christ above culture. This view showed, uh, I showed, saw obedience to Christ in the world as importance. It had a positive view of culture, especially as an aid to humanitarian effort. It also can fall into the trap of a superior mental attitude. Then I looked at the Christ in culture in paradox. It was similar to Christ above view, but with an added twist, which was that it saw a real tension between believers and the world. I pointed out that the mer that this mirrors a Christian experience and that it can lead to Christians feeling inferior in the world. Finally, I looked at Christ the transformer of cultural view. This view sees creation as important and is not to be in intimidated by atonement. Augustine and F.D. Morris were considered. I pointed out that Bath notes the church needs power from God to do its task, and the transformer view does not realize this. I finished pointed out how Bonhoeffer and this view destroy antithesis thinking, something I think could be dangerous in relation to the doctrine of evil. So which view is best for today? In one sense, it's hard to choose as they all have much to offer. I think the Christ against culture tends to stick its head in the sand. I do think I'd I, I do not think it's relevant to hide away from the world and watch it go by. As for the Christ of culture, it loses any force to me because it tends to build Christ in its own image. If I am to be relevant, I must be faithful to the New Testament witness and not mold the incarnation to fit my ideas. The Christ above culture is appealing. I like the humanitarianism as well as its commitment to Christ, but it seems to be lacking maybe a lack of realism in the first in the face of spiritual antagonism. This leads me to the Christ in culture in paradox. I like this because it has the Christ above you in it but a little more. The more is a real sense of spiritual warfare. For all the benefits of Christ the transformer culture view it seems to be Christianity without any moral or spiritual backbone. I am moving more to Christ in culture in paradox. Does this paradox view accord with the Bible? I think it does as fresh look at Paul will show and um, I just do a little study on, on on that but I'll leave that there so any thoughts mate? I think there's um, I think there's bits of truth in all of them isn't there? Yeah, yeah. I mean the, go the gospel is it, is it there's nuggets of the gospel in all of them. Yeah, yeah. And it's just bringing it all together as a whole, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, that's what I think. I think uh, the New Testament's bigger than any one model. Yeah. Um, I think... Um, I, think, I think what I get out of it is what... I, I always remember Dr. Rainey, <laughs> and he always used to say, make sure what you do is theologically based. And I think when you look today at our culture it's in the church, it, it, it's, there's nothing, it's not rooted in theology at all. There's no theological reflection or, or anything in the church. Mm. And... Um, generally speaking, not, not everywhere, but generally. And when you look at our history, when you look at, um, uh, what's his name, Irenaeus, how he de mm. deals with the Gnostics and the issue of culture there, it's all scriptural and he's grappling with scripture. And you look at Augustine, you look at all these great theologians and they're all, they're all grappling with the Bible and trying to relate the Bible to their culture in some way. Mm. And for me, I get out of this tonight, what I get out of it is I need to be more in my Bible and more studying it and listening to that and asking God how does that, how does the Bible and what it teaches relate to today. But I need to be in the Bible, I need to be studying the Bible, I need to deal with the world, not on the world's terms, but on mm. Christ's terms. Yeah. You know, and I think today it's the other way around. I think the church is dealing, like you said, the church is trying to deal with the world on the world's terms, with the world's resources, with the, but 
we're to do it the other way around. We're to do it on the way Christ wants us to do it. And I think yeah. I think we're losing it. We're losing that more and more. Yeah. I mean, what was the Great Commission? To go out to all the world, make disciples, baptizing them, teaching them everything. It says, and afterwards, this is in Mark chapter 16. Oh, just, uh, just a little note. If anyone tells you that last ending of Mark's not in Mark, have a read of Dean Bergen on, on his paper, The Last Ending of Mark. Uh, just a little thought there, just in case anyone ever tells you that uh, The Last Ending of Mark's not in Mark, because that's become popular today. Um, but in Mark chapter 16, 16 it says and afterwards he appeared unto the eleven and they sat at meat and upbraided them with their unbelief and hardness of heart because they believed not them which had seen him after he was arisen and he said unto them go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved but he that believeth not shall be damned you know, and then it goes, and the sign shall follow them and believe in thy name and cast out devils. They shall speak with new tongues and they shall take up serpents. And if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. And they shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. So then after the Lord had spoken unto them, he was received up into heaven and sat on the right hand of God and they went forth and preached everywhere the Lord working with them and confirming the word with signs and following Amen mm. but the great commission there was to go and preach the gospel um, and it was, a that it was a spiritual commission I mean God God blessed it God saying he's going to bless it with signs mm -hmm. but they were to go out and preach that gospel and, and um, I think in 1 Corinthians 2 Corinthians chapter 5 uh, it says um, Verse 12, For we commend not ourselves again unto you, but give you occasion to glory on our behalf, that you may have somewhat to answer them, which glory in appearance and not in art. For whether we beside ourselves, it is to God. For whether we be sober, it is for your cause. For the love of Christ compels us, because we thus judge that if one died for all, then we're all dead, and that he died for all, and that they which lived should not henceforth live unto themselves but unto him which died for them and rose again wherein henceforth know ye we no man after the flesh yes though we have known christ after the flesh yet now henceforth know we him no more therefore if any man be in christ he is a new creature all things are passed away and behold all things are become new and all things are of god and have reconciled us to himself by jesus christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation to which that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself not imputing the trespasses unto them and have committed unto the word of reconciliation then he says verse 20 now that we are ambassadors for Christ as though God did beseech you by us we pray you in Christ's stead be ye reconciled to God he that made him to be sin for us who knew no sin that we might be made the righteousness of God in him so we're ambassadors mm. we're, we're not uh, we're not we're not culturally um, we're not principle we're not culturally fitter in us mm. we're ambassadors mm. 